Sometimes you just can't help it. You're standing in line at the coffee shop, minding your own business, but the conversation in front of you is loud enough to include you. Or you're pressed into an awkward spot on a crowded bus, and you can't help but notice what the strangers squashed into your back are talking about. Often eavesdropping is not all that interesting. We spend a lot of our time talking about pretty ordinary stuff. What we need to pick up at the store on the way home, or where to get a good view of the Fete de Genève fireworks. But sometimes you overhear a conversation that's just plain strange. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. In my experience, that's not a normal way to speak. If I overheard snippets of that conversation while waiting at the train station, I'm not sure if I would keep eavesdropping or quietly choose another line. There's no getting around it. It is a strange conversation we are dropping into in John's Gospel today. In fact, if you drop in just about anywhere in the Gospel of John, it's probably going to sound strange. In this Gospel in particular, Jesus sometimes talks like he's levitating 10,000 meters up in the air, his head in the clouds and his feet an awfully long way from the ground and its mundane, everyday concerns. The crowds who are talking with Jesus in our reading today are there precisely because of very earthy, everyday concerns. They were hungry and he fed them, all 5,000 of them, with what looked like a dinner for one. They are there to talk about the hunger in their bellies, and in response, Jesus is talking about bread that comes from heaven, and his origin with the Father, and life that never ends. It can feel like Jesus is kind of floating above it all in some place that's far too spiritual to be concerned with all this ordinary, earthy stuff. Jesus is extraordinary in John's Gospel. There's no doubt about that. But in this passage, we also find something very surprising and no less important. In this passage, Jesus is also the ordinary kid from Nazareth. Don't we know his parents? The people are saying to one another when he starts talking about his eternal origins in God. Isn't this the kid who helped build my house a couple years ago? They ask when he starts talking like a celestial being who just dropped out of the sky. Isn't he our neighbor? And yes, the gospel will insist. He is your neighbor. And he is also from God. This is the tension that is right there at the heart of our reading today. Ordinary and extraordinary. Jesus is as familiar as can be and also completely and marvelously strange. He is bread from heaven. It's easy to start from the extraordinary part in John's Gospel. Jesus is God's eternal word who was present in the beginning with God and he not only talks the talk but he also walks the walk. He goes around performing these incredible signs, turning water into wine, and walking on the sea, and even raising the dead. We get it, John. He's one of a kind, not your everyday healer and preacher. You can't miss the extraordinary in Jesus, but what I think you can miss in all of that blinding light and fanfare is the fact that right alongside it, and wed to it, is the simple and the plain and the very ordinary. Today's reading is a perfect example, and particularly the part where Jesus makes one of his famous I am statements. A little clue for reading John is that whenever Jesus says I am, it's a good time to perk your ears up and listen carefully, because it's going to be something important. I am is the language that God used in Exodus when Moses asked for God's name. I am who I am, God said. So when Jesus starts talking that way, it's pointing to who he is most deeply. God's word enfleshed in a human being. So Jesus winds up with one of these great I am statements, a pronouncement of his divine nature, and we should expect it to be big. But look at what he says. Not 
I am the eternal, all-powerful overlord, not I am untouchable, unknowable wisdom from on high, not I am the profound spiritual life that you would understand if only you could get past all your silly everyday concerns, but this, I am bread. I am the bread of life. Well, you can't get much more extraordinary than the eternal unbegotten word. You can't get much more ordinary than bread. In Jesus' time and culture, at least. There's nothing particularly romantic about it. It's not fancy or gourmet or rare. It's not filet mignon or a special variety of truffles. It's food that is simple, common, and there on the table without fanfare or show. That was undoubtedly the case when it came to bread in Jesus' day. But of course, bread doesn't play that role in absolutely every culture. And as we were discussing this passage at Bible study this last week, we discovered what a problem this has been when it comes to translating the Bible. We discovered that in some translations, in some of the cultures represented in the room, Bible translators had taken this word bread and translated it just that way, even though bread plays little or no role in the diets of those cultures. So when Jesus says, for example, I am the bread of life to certain indigenous communities in Latin America, he's telling them that he is food they might eat once a month, that's overpriced and imported, and has little or no nutritional value. <laughs> Hopefully some translators have gotten this right because there are places in the world where this probably should read, I am the tortilla of life, or I am the rice bowl of life. And we giggled a little bit at how that, those phrases sound, but if they sound funny or strange, or not holy enough, not all pious and perfect like I am the bread of life, then that's actually just right. Because when Jesus dropped that statement on the crowd about being bread from heaven, it apparently sounded pretty strange to all of them, too. Something as extraordinary as heaven, tied to something as ordinary as this guy, with his clothes like ours and his hunger like ours, and his parents who live down the street, He's far too ordinary to be from heaven. Bread from heaven. That phrase shouldn't just sound like a bland, churchy yawn. It should sound baffling and bizarre and unsettling. Oil and water fighting with each other. A marriage of two worlds, the extraordinary and the ordinary. Because that's who Jesus is. That's who Jesus is, and it's who we need him to be. The writer Michael Shapin has a way of describing daily life that caught me when I first read it, and it has a way of haunting me still from time to time. Every day is like a kid's drawing, he writes, offered to you with a strange mixture of ceremoniousness and offhand disregard, yours for the keeping. Some of the days are rich and complicated, others inscrutable, Others little more than a stray gray mark on a ragged page. Some you manage to hang on to, though your reasons for doing so are often hard to fathom. But most of them, you just ball up and throw away. Does that knock you in the gut the way it does me? I don't think it's only the fact that I happen to have a three-year-old who does, in fact, pass on an almost daily supply of drawings that vary in just that way. But it's that far too often, I do allow the days to slip by with unremarkable ordinariness, not doing much of anything to mark them or savor them. I rush through a list of tasks. I pause here and there to breathe. I get to the end of the day and prepare to do it all over again. These rich and complicated and inscrutable and ordinary days are the only ones there are. And what do I do with them? The gospel offers an answer because Jesus is at home in the ordinariness of our days. And in him, the ordinary and the extraordinary are brought together. In him, this one who is both earthly and heavenly, both fully human and fully divine, the way the creeds say it, in him, the oil and the water actually come together and mix and meet. In him, bread 
is heavenly. In him there is the promise that ordinary things can convey extraordinary grace. And if that's the case, then much of our task is simply being awake to its truth. To the truth that an overheard conversation can wake us up to the beauty and mystery of life. To the truth that a piece of bread baked by an ordinary person, no more perfect or heaven-born than you or me, an ordinary piece of bread can touch on a deep hunger for a world made right. To the truth that a splash of water that came from the tap, and before that from an ordinary well in the ground, a bit of water can remind us who we most deeply are. To the truth that a word of encouragement from a friend can be better than the bread from angels. Bread doesn't come from heaven. It comes from flour that grows in the soil and yeast that bubbles in warm water and hands that mix and knead the dough. Bread doesn't come from heaven, it comes from the earth. But that's just the thing. In Jesus, the two meet, and earth gets heavened once and for all. Can we look at the world that way? Can we look at our lives that way? What difference would that make? This bread I'm talking about, Jesus says, is, is bread of eternal life. And well, here we go again. Blasting off into the clouds, you may be saying. Off to some distant world and some distant future. But look at the tense. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. Jesus says, has in the present. Not in some far off day, not in some far off place, but now. Pay attention to this one who links heaven and earth. Trust in him and you'll have a taste of what life that doesn't end is like. Whoever believes has eternal life. That's what Jesus offers. This one who is as ordinary as the person sitting next to you and as extraordinary as God's eternal word. Bread from heaven. The sustenance we need for our ordinary days touched with extraordinary grace. A glimpse of eternal life here today and now. Amen.